It's 1981, and to most Australians, the cops are the good guys, keeping the streets clean and our families safe. But in the nation's biggest police force, truth was stranger than fiction. It was like the plot of a bad Hollywood movie. Police so corrupt that they become leading drug suppliers, officers in the hold-up squad who organise armed robberies and even murders. And behind it all, one of the nation's most celebrated officers, proven to be a terrorising criminal. He is a sociopath. I have not personally come across one crooked cop. Incredibly, it wasn't the government of the day who lifted the lid on this extraordinary corruption. It would be a single mother, a heroin addict and King's Cross prostitute named Sally Ann Huckstep. I know it sounds unbelievable, but it's real and it's happening. In 1981, Sally Ann would give an exclusive television interview that would eventually trigger the biggest clean-out of crooked cops in Australian police history. But large parts of her tell-all story have never been seen, kept in a vault until now. When the police become judge, jury and executioner, then somebody has to speak. It was an explosive interview, and one that Sally Ann knew could prove fatal. And indeed, five years later, she was murdered. A crime that has never been solved. By nature, she was a fighter. By nature, she was going to get revenge. Tonight, for the first time, we reveal the full and extraordinary story of how the bravery of one young woman turned the tide on dirty cops. Beginning of the end of that sort of police corruption. And the officer she exposed and disgraced, Roger Rogerson. Good evening, I'm Liz Hayes, and this is Under Investigation. <laughs> Joining me tonight in an exclusive appearance, the New South Wales Police Commissioner, Mick Fuller. John Dale, who literally wrote the book on Sally Ann's life and tragic death. John Laycock, the former assistant police commissioner who re-examined Sally Ann Huckstep's murder and worked with Roger Rogerson as a young cop. Kate McClymont, the award-winning investigative journalist whose work helped expose the police corruption first called out by Sally Ann Huckstep. And joining us from the north coast of New South Wales, Mick Drury, former New South Wales drug squad detective who was almost murdered for being a good cop in Roger Rogerson's crooked circle. Thank you all for joining me. Can I start with you, Commissioner? Do you have a view of that era and the role that Sally Ann Huckstep played in that? Yeah, look, it's an amazing era, part of the New South Wales police force. We probably saw some of the worst corruption that we've seen in modern history as a result. Kate, you were a young journo at the time. What did you make of it? Look, it was an extraordinary time, basically because the, the police officers that we thought were the ones that were meant to be holding criminals to account were actually part of the criminal enterprise themselves. It was just extraordinary. Mick Drury, you were there. How do you describe that era? I think it was a criminal phenomena and it had a profound impact on life in Sydney, stemming from King's Cross. Oh, it's hard to believe now the corruption that occurred during the 70s and early 80s. And, and therefore, Sally Ann Huckstep's role in that was unique. It was, it was. And I think she's only now being really appreciated for what she did. It's June 27th, 1981. A small-time heroin dealer and street thug is shot dead by a New South Wales police officer in an inner Sydney laneway. The criminal was 22-year-old Warren Lamfranchi, and the officer, New South Wales super cop, Detective Sergeant Roger Rogerson. It is reported as the dramatic killing of a Sydney crim, 
And the story might have ended there, except that the Crim's girlfriend happens to be a young King's Cross prostitute named Sally Ann Huckstep. Risking her life and just days after the shooting, Sally Ann goes public with all that she knows in a 60 Minutes interview with journalist Ray Martin. Sally, we hear so often of corruption in the police force, corruption at King's Cross. How much corruption is there? It's total. Total. The claims Sally Ann makes about the New South Wales police are almost beyond belief for a 1980s public. I've been paying the police for 10 years. Um, what, as a prostitute? As a prostitute. My ex-husband was a criminal. I paid the police many times for him. I would have been quite happy to go on paying the police because it's a way of life and it's the way you survive. But when the police become judge, jury and executioner, then somebody has to speak. Somebody has to come forward. Somebody has to start somewhere and stop it. Everybody, no matter who they are, heroin dealers, murderers, thieves, everybody is entitled to justice. For Sally Ann to actually be brave enough to go on 60 Minutes, you know, the preeminent show of the day and to make these claims is like a really, really brave act because she knew exactly what she was dealing with. John Dale, you describe her as the, the real first whistleblower. I think she's the most important whistleblower in New South Wales police history, by, by far. For legal reasons, only a fraction of Sally Ann's interview was aired. The full 16 millimetre film would be locked away and forgotten for four decades. But her first-hand account of a police force gone rogue and the doubt she cast on a hero police officer who was, in truth, a drug lord and brutal murderer, was electrifying. I remember going up there uh, to the 22nd floor or so of the Hilton Hotel, and she was quite emotional that night. She was uh, uh, crying beforehand about uh, what had happened to Lan Franchi, not about talking to us, but what had happened. She was chain smoking beforehand, and yet she was clearly tough. My memory was how articulate and how together she was uh, for a 25 or 26 year old woman who'd been to Helen back. And she wanted to tell the story, and she also wanted to, to get um, Roger Rogerson. And so I sat there as a, as, as a journalist, almost with my mouth open. John Laycock, did you see the interview? I did see the interview. Was, it, was your instinct, though, that she was telling tr the truth, or did you just dismiss her? I didn't dismiss her. Um, from a personal view, um, it was quite shocking, actually. Admitting on camera that you are a, you know, had been a heroin user and a prostitute, and that you had been paying police, it definitely had the ring of credibility. And I remember thinking, wow, I don't know how much you've bitten off here, but good luck to you. Watching it, and, and I have had dealings with, with prostitutes in operational and, and heroin addicts, and I worked across in the late 90s. Um, she, she was so articulate and believable, and, and I think that was her personality. Well, you watch it now, she's a heroin addict prostitute, but she was believable. And uh, John Dale? I did see it, and my feeling at the time when I saw it, I thought, she's not going to live very long. I think the police thought that uh, I'd shut my mouth. As I've kept quiet all these years. Prostitute and heroin addict Sally Ann Huckstep appears on 60 Minutes to blow the whistle on the king of New South Wales crooked cops, Roger Rogerson. Oh, we fear for our lives. Five years after that interview, Sally Ann was found dead, strangled face down in a pond in Sydney's Centennial Park. Oh, you 
But who was Sally Ann Huckstep? A perfect fit. Born into a middle class Jewish family in Sydney's affluent eastern suburbs, she attended a private school, Mariah College, and was considered a bright student. But she struggled with her parents' early divorce. And at 13, she ran away from home. At just 14, she was working as a waitress at Sydney's notorious King's Cross Club, Whiskey A Go Go. And at 15, she turned to prostitution to pay for a growing drug habit, she keeps no an addiction she desperately tried to break. She keeps no secrets from you. I knew I was really slipping. So I was going uh, downhill very rapidly. By the time Sally Ann turned 20, she'd amassed dozens of convictions for prostitution and paid out thousands of dollars in bribes to corrupt cops. Then in early 1981, she fell for a heroin dealer and standover man named Warren Lanfranchi, a man who would change her life, a man who would indirectly lead her to her death. Physically, he was a very strong man. Was he a thug? Well, I was a criminal. I don't know whether I'd call him a thug. But, you know, you've got to face facts why I was a criminal. He certainly wasn't the clean-cut boy next door. No, he certainly wasn't that. I, I think, Kate, you would say that he was good for um, Sally Ann, strangely. Well, apart from the fact that um, they met through her prostitution, uh, the first thing he did was send her red roses. And look, he was the one for all his faults, of which there were many. Um, he got her off heroin, he cleaned her up. He was planning for them to amass enough money to get some false passports, to go and live overseas and to start afresh. Uh, look, and I also want to make the point that um, Sally Ann, was, was she in love? with Warren Lamfranchi, but this she, was love. Yes, yes, she said she was. Although she'd only met him four or five months, but she, I think she fell in love quickly with him, yes. I thought he was a very horny guy. But, you know, personally, I was very attracted to him. He was... John Laycock, you came into contact with Warren Lamfranchi. Actually, I did in the 1970s. He was just a petty thief of the day. There was nothing uh, spectacular about him. The name was unusual and um, he went in the dock and got charged and went to court and went to jail. In the day, when you went to jail, you came out a better criminal than what you went in. And I think when you look at all the characters in, in this sad play, is that they all went to jail and, and always came out better criminals. But didn't he meet, Lanfranchi actually met Nettie Smith yeah. while in jail. The ferocious Arthur Nettie Smith was one of Sydney's most infamous criminals, a 200 centimetre or six foot six colossus in the Australian crime scene. He was now Warren Lamfranchi's boss in Sydney's booming heroin trade. Look, the problem for Warren Lanfranchi was this. He was running on the edge. He became violent in ripping people off. And the problem for Warren, he didn't know at the time, was that he ripped off a criminal for a large amount of heroin, and that heroin came from Roger Rogerson. Detective Rogerson has a reputation as being a very evil man. Parts of this interview were never broadcast, but the information was given to police internal affairs. It would be the beginning of the end for Australia's dirtiest cop. There are a lot of very uh, heavy criminals who are terrified of him. He's, there have been people disappear who are thought to have been murdered by Detective Rogerson. I think Rogerson, to me, is a very interesting forensic study. He is a sociopath 
and the only one that I know of in Australian police history. These are very dangerous people. It's late one night in 1981 when Warren Lanfranchi makes a fatal decision to rip off two heroin dealers. But what Lanfranchi doesn't know is the heroin he's stolen actually belongs to the gangster other criminals fear most, the one with a badge, Roger Rogerson. Now, how much was the heroin worth that Warren had now stolen? Well, it was extremely high-grade heroin. Uh, it was worth $37,000 to Warren and $37,000? Was there then a contract out on him? Were there then people after him? Oh, yes, but Warren wasn't particularly concerned about that until we got word that it was Rogerson. It was who? That it was Detective Rogerson's heroin. That did, this guy was working for Detective Rogerson. Detective Sergeant Rogerson of the New South Wales Police Force. That's right. Just let me get us clear. The men who wanted to sell drugs to Warren were working for Detective Sergeant Rogerson. That's right. What happened then? Well, we went into hiding. Why? Because we were terrified. We thought he'd kill us. Detective Sergeant Roger Caleb Rogerson, honoured with 13 police awards, once even touted as a future police commissioner, was a cop with a secret and a deadly double life. And he was now hunting down Sally Ann and her lover, Warren Lamfranchi, who knew better than most criminals the danger he was in. Had Warren had dealings with Detective Rogerson before? Well, he knew Sergeant Rogerson was uh involved in armed robberies. He knew that Detective Rogerson supplied drugs. Well, it was a large heroin deal. That he supplied heroin to Parramatta Jail. He supplied heroin to Parramatta Jail? That's right. Seems pretty incredible, doesn't it? But you know anyone watching this would say, right, here's a man whom society might well call a thug, for want of a better word pointing a finger at a member of the police force, saying that he's a major dealer in heroin, saying that he supplies Parramatta Jail with heroin. Why should anyone believe Warren? Well, it's common knowledge that the police, the drug squad sells heroin. Why couldn't Warren simply say, I've made a terrible mistake, here's the $37,000 back? because we were terrified. Detective Rogerson has a reputation as being a killer. In fact, Warren was so terrified, he went and bought himself a gun and used to sleep with it next to the bed because we were terrified that Rogerson was gonna find out where we were and come in and kill us both in our bed. We've never had a sociopath in the police force so well positioned as this man. It was like Chicago in the 1920s. People in downtown Sydney, Australia, could not believe that this was going on. Sydney drug dealer Warren Lamfranchi and his girlfriend, prostitute Sally Ann Huckstep, are in hiding, fearful for their lives. Lamfranchi has ripped off Sydney's dirtiest cop, Roger Rogerson. Now, Rogerson is hunting him. So, Warren's boss, gangster Neddy Smith, cuts a deal with Rogerson. As Sally Ann told Ray Martin on 60 Minutes, it was a deal Lamfranchi hoped would save both their lives. How much? He wanted $30,000. He wanted $10,000 immediately. Then he was going to uh, show Warren a robbery. Show Warren a robbery? What does that mean? Well, he was going to uh, uh, show Warren. How to carry out a robbery? A robbery he could do 
with all the inside information. The policeman was going to show Warren how to do a robbery. That's right. Robbery was so that Warren could pay Rogerson the other, t the balance of the thirty thousand, plus he wanted a cut of the proceeds from the robbery. I was astonished. I was astonished when she, she gave us that intricate detail of what was going on. I mean, it is laughable. It's a, it's a stuff of, uh, of comedy that the, the drug squad is dealing in the drugs, that the, the armed hold-up squad is, is organising the armed hold-ups. Look, armed robberies at the time were the choice of, of criminals, right? And, and banks, payrolls, uh, it was a huge criminal enterprise before heroin. It was probably the primary driver of cash and organised crime. Agreeing to Rogerson's terms, Lanfranchi decides to meet the New South Wales Detective Sergeant alone at Dangar Place in Sydney's inner city. What Lanfranchi doesn't know as he leaves Sally Ann that afternoon is that there is no deal, that Rogerson is coming for him with a small army. Sally Ann says Lanfranchi is unarmed, carrying only $10,000 cash he has promised Rogerson as a down payment. I asked Warren to bring some flowers home for me. And he turned around and said, well, darling, you never know. You could be sending me flowers. We had $10,000, which we'd wrapped up into bundles with elastic bands right round it. He put the money down the front of his pants and pulled his jumper down over the top of it. I kissed him at the door and asked him what time he thought he'd be back because I'd be worried, you know. I mean, I didn't want him to go. You didn't want him to go? No. He said he didn't know what time he'd be home, but if he wasn't home by 6 o'clock, then I'd know he was He'd been killed. Recreated years later in the drama Blue Murder, accompanied by his boss and the dealmaker, gangster Nettie Smith, Lanfranchi approaches Rogerson in the Sydney laneway and is shot in cold blood. A second execution shot is delivered to his head. Kate, you said you found it fascinating that Rogerson felt the need to kill Lanfranchi himself. Yes, I think that is one of the strange things. But the thing that also amazes you is the, the group of police that he surrounded himself with. Why did he need to take, um, I think there was 18 all up, but there was about four police officers in that inner circle he took his posse, right? He didn't take tactical police. He didn't take, you know, a mix of surveillance police. He had his, he had his posse with him, his trusted people. Rogerson's corrupt inner circle covered for him, claiming Lamfranchi had pulled a gun. Those on the perimeter who were not in on Rogerson's plan later said they knew his second shot was the mark of a murder. This bloody moment will in one crack open the corruption at the heart of the New South Wales police force and confirm suspicions some already had. The police, um, you know, ballistics and ammunition expert said the gun that the police claimed that Warren Lanfranchi had brought with him was an 80-year-old model that it was basically defective and would be lucky to fire one shot. Why would a seasoned criminal take a defective weapon to a meet like that? It, it doesn't ring true. Warren grew up in a highly connected world of major drug distribution. Why would, when he's surrendering, pull a gun out and infuriate a deadly man like Roger Rogerson. The killing in broad daylight was reported in the tabloids as high noon, with Rogerson painted as a hero. But Sally Ann's interview with 60 Minutes 
was about to change that story forever. See, Warren knew too much. Warren knew too much about Detective Rogerson and his involvement in organised crime. We couldn't get to talk to Roger Rogerson. The critical factor in this story, the critical person was Sally Ann Huckerton. But how do you get her on camera at that stage? Sally, as we discovered, was, uh, was keen to talk, keen to blow the whistle on Roger Rogerson. But it was a matter of how she did it and how she did it uh, and, and kept alive. I mean, she really feared for her life. They're extraordinary charges. I mean, for most Australians, this is the stuff of fiction. That's something that happens in Hollywood or with the Mafia. When Sally Ann's interview broadcast on Sunday, the 5th of July, 1981, much of it was considered too defamatory to air. But shortly afterwards, she repeated her claims to police internal affairs. A detective squad in Sydney arranges hold-ups. That's right. And the drug squad sells, sells heroin. I know there are people watching this who are just not going to believe this. And in broad daylight, on a Saturday afternoon, a detective sergeant executes a man. That's what you're saying. That's right. He'd murdered him in broad daylight and thought that he could get away with it, as he's probably got away with it before. That's not the way Australians read it on Sunday morning in the newspapers. Unfortunately, uh, a lot of what Australians read in the newspapers is what the police allow them to read. She spoke to us for 60 minutes and then it hit the fan the next day on the Monday and suddenly the police uh, newspapers were on the story and the police wanted to know more details because she had fingered Rogerson and the police uh, running the drug business in New South Wales. There'd been stories in my early uh, journalism career of the police commissioner clearly being crooked uh, in New South Wales. There'd been stories of the, of the Premier of New South Wales having been on the take from various gambling syndicates and so on. So I wasn't exactly naive but this, to get a chapter and verse from um, this woman who had been in the thick of things, if you like, uh, was pretty shocking, uh, even for me. She'd talk so easily and so openly about, um, about the police um, knocking people off, uh, about the police being in charge of the heroin trade, traffic at that stage, and uh, it was hard not to shake your head and say, this is amazing. People find it very hard to conceive that uh upstanding, upright members of our police force are corrupt. They don't want to believe it. It doesn't make you feel very protected. And most people just can't conceive of it. Kate, why did she do it? Really, why? She knew how dangerous this was. Her? love of her life is murdered, as she sees it, in cold blood on a Saturday afternoon in the middle of inner city Sydney. 60 Minutes goes to air less than a week later. The rules of engagement have been broken. She packs him off with the money because that's how she knew you do business. You pay to get an outcome and the outcome that she got was not the agreed deal that she and Warren Lanfranchi she thought that they had had. And so she did that interview because she wanted to show them for what they were. John Dale, you would say that Sally Ann had had enough. I think she'd had enough. She'd paid police over 10 years, the Vice Squad and the Drug Squad. But she knew when she went on television, she knew that she was going to get killed herself. And she even told Lance Franchi's father that they'll, they'll get me for this. Yeah, she was angry. Yeah, she was. About it? how it was done. She had played by the rules, right? She paid the corrupt cops. You know, she had done what she needed to do. And this was the ultimate breach well, of that so criminal contract. I think it was a case of her being so upset that she wanted to get square. And that's the bottom line. Her life spiralled but even when it was spiralling, she still played by the rules. And I think that that was the final straw for her, that she was ending the game that she was in, even though that she knew the consequences, but it could have been she loses her life. Yeah. There's still some core value in her 
that was hanging on to this is not right. Absolutely, and, and that's why I, I think she was looking for justice at, at any cost. Her coming on television and sowing um, doubts about Roger Rogerson was, in many ways, it was the beginning of the end for him. And he always said later about Lanfranchi that that little shit caused the downward spiral of my career. Rogerson did say to her, gave her a warning that once she was out of the headlines, she was for the knock, as he said. In November 1981, an inquest is held into the killing of Warren Lamfranchi. Roger Rogerson is all but exonerated, but not quite, thanks in part to Sally Ann's testimony. I have to leave the country. I've uh, upset the balance. A lot of detectives, I suppose, are going to be scared. The coronial jury accepts Rogerson was acting in the line of duty, attempting to arrest Lamfranchi, but rejects his claim that he shot Lamfranchi in self-defence. And that was largely due to two witnesses who lived nearby. Mary McElhone and Jane Healy heard Rogerson's two gunshots. There was a gap of about 12, 13 seconds, and we heard another gunshot when we said that it was such a large time between the shots, when Rogerson had said they were virtually immediately after the other, it must have given the police quite a shock because it was clear that they were not bang, bang. It was the first time I realised police could lie. He lied. I, I, I know he lied and he said that the shots were in quick succession. That's not what happened and I was really shocked. Those two women, Mary and Jane, they were vital at the inquest because they gave evidence that the shots were at least 11 seconds apart. It that is second shot, the, the second isn't shot, Liz, absolutely cost him everything. The witnesses' bombshell testimony dented Rogerson's story and his public and professional image. But this inquest is now starting to pull Rogerson apart, isn't it? Absolutely. The fall of Roger Rogerson can be dated from Sally Ann Huckstep's bombshell allegations on 60 Minutes in 1981. But in 1984, Rogerson also crossed paths with a singular and very straight cop, and that was undercover detective Mick Drury. Offered a bribe to turn a blind eye to one of Rogerson's drug deals, Mick's refusal put him in Rogerson's line of fire. So Mick, when you were offered that bribe by Roger Rogerson, uh, what did you think? Well, you have to be very game and very strong to turn your back on Roger Rogerson. Roger Rogerson was powerfully connected not only in the underworld, but also by a very small number of extremely senior, well-connected police. On the evening of June 6, 1984, Mick Drury almost died when he was shot through the window of his Sydney home. Chief suspect, was Roger Rogerson and a contract assassin, Christopher Dale Flannery, nicknamed Mr. Rentacure. Mick Fuller, when you read about a police officer being shot through the window of his own home, what are you thinking? Look, it, it, that was a game changer for, for many people because for, you know, a, a respected undercover police officer to be shot doing the washing up, essentially by another police officer. Like, it, it is almost hard to believe. So Mick, you must look at Sally Ann Huckstep and know how lucky you are. Correct. Roger Rogerson had crossed one line too many and was now becoming a pariah within the police force. And now Sally Ann was the hero. In the wake of the 60 Minutes interview, her life took a new direction, 
working as a journalist and even commissioned to write a book. But as the years passed and Sally Ann drifted out of the public eye and the protection that comes with publicity, she was a marked woman. Her revelations about Rogerson and his criminal web carried an almost certain death sentence. She'd always known it and even foreshadowed it. It was clear that in speaking out, she had made herself a target, but she probably was anyway. I think by nature, she was a fighter. But I was conscious that night, um, I was thinking, do you realise what you're doing? Now, she did, she realised more than I did. She realised um, how murderous, how dangerous uh, that uh, element was that she was talking about. But I think she knew it and she was prepared to take the risk. Uh, I'm quite sure that um, the police <laughs> would probably kill me. On the night of February the 6th, 1986, five years after the fatal shooting of her lover, Warren Lamfranchi, and her tell-all interview, Sally Ann receives a late night phone call and races out the door. A few hours later, her body is found lying face down in Busby Pond within Sydney's Centennial Park. She'd been strangled and drowned, silenced forever. I was in Centennial Park walking the dog on the morning that the police were there retrieving her body from the pond. I didn't witness anything, but knowing what she had said before and being there when they were taking her body out was just something absolutely extraordinary. Did we all reflect upon the interview that she did at that moment and go, OK, there's the connection? Well, you couldn't help it. I mean, she had very publicly taken a stance on 60 Minutes and I think that her days were numbered. Just two months after Sally Ann's murder, the New South Wales Police Force finally rids itself of its most crooked cop. Roger Rogerson is sacked for police misconduct, including improper association with criminals, but he denied any role in Sally Ann's death. Uh, I was shocked when I learnt that Sally Ann Huckstep had been murdered here in Centennial Park. I think it was because she was a, a very attractive and a good looking little, little bird that she got a lot of sympathy from different people, including members of the media and the public. But she really was just a typical common prostitute. 86 was the year that Rogerson was finally pushed out of the organisation. So he had never forgiven her for what he would have thought as ruining his life and his criminal enterprise and, and, and his standing in the community. And maybe there was some sense of finally cleaning up loose ends. It's what Mick was saying about him being a sociopath. And the way he described Sally Ann, I just think it goes to show that in his mind, he was always better, more courageous. And the fact that he held a badge and a gun put him above what he considered a human being with no values, nothing worthwhile, as he said, she was just a common prostitute. And I think that's completely abhorrent. Sally Ann's murder was never solved. The inquest into her death lasted from 1987 to 1991, but only sat for 19 days. The chief suspect emerged as Nettie Smith, who was secretly recorded confessing to the murder and that he'd done it on Rogerson's orders. Nettie Smith was charged in 1996, but acquitted due to lack of evidence. John Laycock headed the New South Wales Police Task Force, Snowy, investigating 14 murders linked to Nettie Smith, including Sally Ann's. You interviewed Nettie Smith, didn't you? We did, yes. And did he give you any belief that he might have murdered? No, look, he refused to answer any questions, but we relied on the, um, on the tape recordings. Uh, we also relied on some DNA, she mainly because believe. on the tape recordings, Nettie Smith indicated that Sally Ann, whilst he's been strangled, scratched his face. Having said that, 
the technology of the day was not that uh, far advanced and we had to take those samples over to the United Kingdom. The results came back as a weak match with Nettie Smith. In the secret recordings made of Nettie Smith, he seems to delight in sharing details of Sally Ann's terrible death. I just snapped her. I just snapped her jugular. She must have been alive when I put her in, left her floating there. Was there anything in those recordings that really stayed with you? Look, he was quite calculating in how she died. Um, graphic detail. Um, I won't repeat some of the things that are on there, but suffice to say, he was quite a vicious and violent man. I think he said that he found strangling someone very satisfying. I think he said it was the best thing he's ever did. While Nettie Smith was acquitted of Sally Ann's murder, he was convicted of two others and is now serving life in prison. The jury came back with a not guilty verdict, but whilst we might have lost one of the little um, um, battles, we certainly won the war. And um, he was convicted and he's put away. He's been in jail now for 32 years and um, he's out of circulation and he'll be coming out horizontal. We have gone back and tried to speak to Nettie Smith um, and, and he is of ill health, which obviously, you know, from our perspective, uh, there's no sorrow there. As John said, that he, he will never leave prison and if he does, he'll be dead. In terms of the police perspective, we believe we know who killed her and, and we got our man. We just didn't get justice for Sally Ann, unfortunately. For his part, John Laycock has no doubt who killed Sally Ann. But as far as I'm concerned, I can confidently say that, in my view, Nettie Smith did murder Sally Ann Huckstep uh, in February of 1986 at Centennial Park. From Hero Cop in 1981, Roger Rogerson's fall accelerated after the murder of Sally Ann Huckstep in the wake of her extraordinary 60 Minutes interview. We were terrified that Robertson was going to find out where we were and come in and kill us both in our bed. In 1989, he was charged with conspiring to murder Mick Drury. In 1995, as a result of Sally Ann's revelations, the Wood Royal Commission investigated police corruption in New South Wales and named Roger Rogerson as one of the central gangsters. But somehow, Rogerson, now known as Roger the Dodger, managed to avoid an actual conviction. That is, until 1999. I'm innocent and I've been convicted on the perjured evidence of a criminal and a prostitute when he was convicted of perverting the course of justice and lying to the Police Integrity Commission. Then, in 2016, Roger Rogerson was sentenced to life imprisonment for the murder of another young drug dealer, Jamie Gow. We're back to the Kashabo days now. Mick Drury, when you saw him go to jail, finally, did it feel like vindication for you? There was a sense of relief there because I knew that my life to a certain degree was a lot safer because he was inside. But what damage did he do to the force? Oh, look, I, I think there was a, a, a reasonable group of corrupt police doing damage equally. And I think the Royal Commission played that out. I, I, I think, you know, the Royal Commission was never about shining a light on the heroes, like the Mick Drury's and the John Laycock's, obviously. And I guess part of that is, is it's important for me to make sure that you know that every generation has good cops and they've protected the community. And in 2021, none of this could happen. And just as the disgrace of Roger Rogerson is now complete, so is the vindication of Sally Ann Huckstep. Her claim in 1981 that Roger Rogerson was one of the country's most corrupt cops was proven to be true. This was highly organised criminal activity. Forget about the word corruption for a moment. It was highly organised criminal activity. 
And, and Rogerson was a terrorising criminal. Absolutely. By the sound of it, at some stage, he was a cop who was getting the job done. Now, was it heroin? Was it the money and the power that changed him? I don't know if we really know the answer to that story. But it's important that we tell these stories so we don't forget the history. History will show that it took the courage of a young woman to expose the darkest period in the history of the New South Wales Police Force knowing full well her revelations would almost certainly end in her death. When the police become judge, jury and executioner, then somebody has to speak. Somebody has to come forward. Somebody has to start somewhere and stop it. Think about how it all ended. I mean, how do you feel? Oh, I, th I think it's, it's terrible, I, I, really sad, but I feel, as uh, John said, that you know, Nettie Smith um, will never be released and Roger Rodson will never be released. She'll be remembered, I think, more and more as someone who did the state and probably the country a favour in exposing what she did. I give Sally Ann Huckstep the last word because she really did do very well at trying to stop it, would you agree? Uh, absolutely, and, and you know, there's a handful of, I think, heroes, um, and, and she has to be number one. And she paid the ultimate price for being a whistleblower. True. It's not just for me. It has to be for other people besides me, besides Warren. This isn't only for me, this is for all the other people who've already suffered and for all the people who could possibly suffer or be killed in the future. This is real. This is not something that I have made up in revenge or in anger. This is just cold, bare fact. Hello, I'm Liz Hayes. Thanks for watching 60 Minutes Australia. Subscribe to our channel now for brand new stories and exclusive clips every week. And don't miss out on our extra minute segments and full episodes of 60 Minutes on 9now.com.au and the 9now app.